go through a little bit of a presentation here on how does cancer die and how do we um, how do we know that we're killing the cancer versus um, if it's just inflammatory? This curve here, um, I'm going to start with the blue curve. The blue curve is your CA markers, your cancer markers, your CEA markers as a function of time. And this is for an example purpose only. Not everyone follows the same curve. But um, the blue line is if there's no intervention, no chemo. Uh, the tumor is just allowed to grow, the cancer is allowed to grow, and you see your um, CA markers exponentially will climb out. And um, finally, the, you know, they'll reach a point where your cancer will probably be terminal, but uh, it can be anywhere from years to months or whatever. But this is typically the curve that your CA markers in your bloodstream will follow in the blue. Now, if you run along here and you have an intervention point, and the intervention can be chemo, anything that's going to ca cause cancer necrosis. In this case here, it's Velasta. And we see, what, for, for example, here in month three, we start the intervention. And we see the cancer markers substantially increase. way above what would be predicted if you had cancer. You'd see your cancer markers swing way high. This is actually a, a, a very good sign. Your oncologist is going to freak out and think that, oh my golly, the cancer is just totally out of control. You got to get on chemo right away. And this causes a very negative approach or a very negative um, uh, treatment basis for cancer. The reality is, and I'm going to go through why this happens, this is caused from cancer cell death. When the cancer cell ruptures and the cancer antigens are all released in a, what's called a step input, you see this huge influx of these cancer antigens in your bloodstream. When they test for it, it's going to be high and they're going to want to intervene with chemo or something at this point. Now, what typically happens in the 30 to 60 days period, your CA markers will start to come down. That means that your cancer, your immune system is trying to clean up all of the dead cells and all of the gook, all the, the guts of the cancer cell. Um, and it spends time trying to um, it, it takes time for that to happen. So I'm going to um, um, uh, try to explain why that is the case. But at this point, you're, you're probably, um, your, your CAT scans may show a slight increase in cell diameter that the oncologist is going to interpret as cancer cell growth when in reality it isn't, it's only the inflammation, the pus, the white blood cells, the macrophages, the, uh, the neutrophils, the, um, the NK, the, the, uh, the, the killer cells. They're all going to accumulate around that dead body battlefield and try to clean up the mess. And that's when we see this bump in the CA numbers. So just be aware of that and understand that it's not necessarily not not necessarily caused from increase in cancer you may the other thing is is that your quality of life your tumors may actually shrink during this period of time your quality of life you're going to gain weight your appetite's going to come back none of those symptoms are common for someone who has cancer so it what it implies is that the cancer cells have died I'm going to talk about two types of cell death, phagocytosis and macro um, uh, phagocytosis. And uh, I want to go through these. Typically, this is a whole graduate level course on the chemistry behind this. I've tried to shrink it down so that it can be understood. 
and uh, you'll get a pretty good picture as to what's actually going on inside your body. It is absolutely remarkable. The, the number of steps and pathways I'm going to ignore. Um, a lot of the chemistry is pretty intense, but this is happening every single day in your body. The uh, exocytosis is on the left there, you see the plasma membrane. Inside are little uh, vesicles or vacuoles. Um, these, these vesicles contain um, cytotoxins. Hypochlorous acid or bleach is one. Um, and that one's very important in what's called lysosomes, which I'm going to talk about a little later. But these little vesicles all reside. They have their own little phospholipid membrane around them. But they, they, they're, they're tanks. They're, they actually hold these chemicals inside there waiting to be released. Now, if this cell here makes contact with the tumor cell, it'll actually open up just like this, and it will secrete these cytotoxins directly onto the cancer cell and kill it. And I've got other pictures in here. I'm going to show, show you how that works. This is called exocytosis. The, um, the poisons are being pushed out. That's what exo means. Then there's what's called endocytosis. Endocytosis is how a uh, macrophage would absorb bacteria. So if this is bacteria, the membrane actually absorbs and closes in around the, the vesicle or creates the vesicle, and inside that vesicle are all of these bacteria. And then, I don't know if I can move this or not, I can't, I think my picture is blocking this, this slide here. Um, but then lysosomes merge with that vesicle and put, pump in bleach, pump in uh, hypochlorous acid, or pump in um, cytotoxic compounds that then dissolves the phospholipid membrane of the bacteria releasing all of its guts and then it releases. Here is another example of how lysosomes work. Lysosomes contain enzymes. Uh, one basic one is, is bleach. We produce a bleach type compound uh, called hypochlorous acid. Very reactive, very biocidal. Um, but here's a case of endocytosis where the, the debris, uh, we, they call them food particles here, but the, these could be the cancer guts, the, the cancer nucleus, the, my, the mitochondria of the cancer cells, all of the chemicals released. And then through endocytosis, the plant absorbs all of that food. I'm going to call it food because it's made up of amino acids and proteins and carbohydrates and lipids, same stuff as we eat. But it brings it in, encapsulates it, and then these lysosomes that come from the Golgi bodies inside the cell, and we always wonder where chlorine comes from with table salt. When we eat salt, chlorine is converted into hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is very similar to uh, bleach. The lysosome then attaches right to the membrane. It absorbs, just like two, two um, soap bubbles merging together. And it secretes these highly toxic compounds in and digests that, quote, food particle. That could be a bacteria, that could be um, waste products, whatever it is. Breaks it down into the basic amino acids. The, this little pocket then is pushed to the surface and it's, it's um, released. And these proteins, they're not really proteins anymore, they're amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, then are recycled to make more human cells. There's 21 essential amino acids in, um, in the human body. So we would use those then as food for the cells. Here's another example of endocytosis, um, uh, phagocytosis. This is how bacteria are destroyed. This is a lysosome attachment. 
and it's essentially the same thing as we saw before. Now, in um, here's a classic case of how a T cell, in this case a, uh, a normal killer cell, these are uh, T cells will, will operate the same way here, cytotoxic T cells. Here's a tumor cell. So once a tumor cell is recognized as a foreign body, these killer cells and T cells will attach. And you'll notice right here, these little sealing pro, uh, uh, enzymes or ligands, proteins basically, and they isolate so that none of this cytotoxic and bleach compounds can escape and do damage to normal cells adjacent to the tumor cell. This is very focused. This is targeted attack on the tumor cell. This is a guided missile. Now, when it merges with that cell membrane of that tumor cell and it forces these bullets, these missiles into the tumor cell, they typically will attack the membrane and they'll crack open the membrane of the tumor cell. Once the membrane of the tumor cell is cracked open, everything is free flowing at that point. So if there's any cancer antigens, which, which there are, inside this cancer cell, when this cancer cell ruptures, all of those an antigens are immediately released into the bloodstream. And that's why we see the CA markers elevate almost like a spike. Um, you can see how complicated all the steps are. How do you train a dendritic cell uh, from a CD8 primer? How does a T cell recognize from the polypeptide on the surface of the tumor cell? So that from that point on, how do you turn off the PDL1? Here are your interleukins to, to moderate your T cell so that it doesn't kill everything, including normal cells. So you have to have a, a, a modulation in place. Very, very complicated um, how all of this, uh, the immune system works. Here's one that's pretty busy. Here's a tumor cell being recognized by the natural uh, uh, killer cells. Uh, hopefully, uh, we recognize when a cancer cell forms very, very early on and we take it out. The natural killer cells do that. Very, but if your immune system is uh, compromised, this may not happen. If this tumor cell is not taken out, it grows to this, a, a, a massive tumor. These tumors secrete tumor antigens, and we pick those up as um, with our CA tests, our cancer markers. Um, so these tumor antigens are all in this cell, billions and billions of them. So, but only a few get out. Here's PD-1, PD-L1 signaling um, uh, on, on how the, these, this endo uh, or exocytotic behavior happens. These proteins form. You can see now these chemicals are being released directly onto the cancer cell. Uh, here's uh, granzymes, granzymes and uh, perforin are all openers of the cancer cell. They're secreted. It's, a, it's an extremely violent attack. These things move when it makes contact, the cell membrane makes contact with the tumor membrane through these connectors, these protein connectors. The microtubules, which are the superhighways inside the cell, all begin to get very focused. And it's along these that these little bags or vacuoles are, um, are walked, by the way, on two-legged robots called dienes. If you get the chance, uh, go see a video called Tour of the Cell and Harvard. Tour of the Cell and Harvard on YouTube. You'll see how these dienes, which are two-legged robots that carry these bags right down this super highway called a microtubule and they deposit them close to the cell membrane for release against the, uh, the cancer cells. 
This is uh, this is one that's that's very interesting when we study the, the balance, the yin and yang of the immune system. So we have what activates the immune system. <clears throat> the dendritic cells read the peptides. So the cancer cell releases an antigen, and an antigen is nothing more than a short chain representation of the tumor cell, and it resides in this receptor. This dendritic cell will read that. And then that dendritic cell will program these helper cells that then teach the T cell what to look out for. And when that happens, <clears throat> this communication that happens here, once this T cell becomes somewhat knowledgeable of this peptide, these killer cells will then move in and recognize every cell that has that polypeptide signaling to it, and it will kill it. Now, this is the activating side of a T cell attack. Over here, you have the inhibitory side because this not only will kill cancer cells, this will kill normal cells. This is called autoimmune disease. When you're inhibited or your inhibitors are somewhat suppressed, and you can't turn off the inflammatory response, you're gonna end up with an inflammatory disease like Graves' disease, Hashimoto's, um, all of the autoimmune diseases. COVID is a great example. COVID shuts off interleukin-4, interleukin-10, shuts off the ability for these suppressor mechanisms to be in place. So with COVID, you have a huge res inflammatory response. This is the gas pedal. These are the brakes. And when the brakes no longer work, you have an out of control inflammatory response. And this is why people died from COVID. <clears throat> Here's another example of the tumor cell um, being signaled by the T cell. You can see the inner interplay of the interleukin-6, interleukin-8, interleukin-10. Interleukin-10 is a suppressive um, molecule. Um, here are exosomes that are peeled off from the T cell. They'll go over and attach to the tumor cell and release hypochlorous acid. It's a major attack. And um, that's why it's so important to keep your immune system healthy. And um, because if any of these go away, you're predisposed, whether you're, you might genetically be pre predisposed for disease, but your immune system is programmed such that it stops between your genetic predisp predisposition and your disease, your final disease state. So keep your immune system healthy. Now, how does a cell membrane um, come apart. One of the um, most common methods inside our cell membrane, we have phospholipid membranes. They're, they're, they're diphosphates. So this is a phosphorus group, which is water loving here and here. These are fatty acids. It's little tails that stick off of it. These are hydrophobic. These do not want water in them. They're afraid of water. That's what phobic means. Hydrophilic means water loving. So this will always face the water phase. This is all oil based. Now cholesterol does a, a couple things. The gap between these phospholipid membranes, if it's increased, your membranes will move more flexible at low temperature. There's a temperature correlation here. Um, at high temperature or at, at body, uh, body temperatures, these have a tendency to stiffen your cell membranes. So cholesterol accumulation in between the phospholipid membranes not only has a physical characteristic in changing the rigidity of the cell membrane, which shear can tear it apart if it's very rigid, um, it also is a function of what that cholesterol is. If that cholesterol has 
double bonds or reactive sites to it, the hydroxyl free radical will go in and, and attach to those double bonds. And now you have an OH sticking off of that cholesterol here and here. So this could be carbon, 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 carbon. Up, oh, there's an OH, there's an OH, there's an OH. OHs are hydrophilic. They love water. So the more you hydrolyze the phospholipid membrane with the hydroxyl free radical, the more water soluble this whole membrane becomes. Water is a great solvent. So water molecules will tend to permeate inside this cell membrane and cause these to separate, just like oil on water. And once it separates, the membrane comes apart. So this is part of the hypochlorous attack. This could be a chlorine instead of an OH. Anything that makes it more water soluble. Once that happens, the cell membrane will disassociate and come apart. And it happens in normal cells and it happens in uh, cancer cells, anything that has a phospholipid membrane. It can happen in the mitochondria inside of a cell which would initiate apoptosis and cell death. This one's even more, more busy. Um, and it's, it's pretty much the same as what we've been talking about. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but all of these things that you see here from a macro view have to happen just to kill a tumor cell. Very, very complex. But the common element is ROS, reactive oxygen species. They are the signaling compounds. They typically, uh, high concentration are very bad. They will cause disease. In low concentrations, for example, if your C-reactive protein is less than one, it can never be zero because we need these uh, free, these reactive oxygen species to do the signaling for the cytokines. Um, a lot of these communications here are triggered by reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species. So there's some positives that you have to have um, with regard to reactive oxygen species. So, but in most cases in our lifestyle, we're generating millions of times more of the reactive oxygen species uh, in concentration than we need just for basic communication. And at that point, um, disease is gonna set in. Here's uh, some positive. Um, this came out of work with hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Um, you see elevated levels of cellular O2 levels. Typically we would think that if you increase the oxygen level, it would increase your ROS, your reactive oxygen species, which it does. Um, so these are the positive things, the communication that's needed for wound healing, neutrophil, which is your first warrior on the site, uh, on, on the wound, by the way, um, it activates them. But if you go too high in ROS or reactive nitrogen species, then they become diseased, you become diseased. So this is something that we, we need to look at very, very carefully. And with that, I'm gonna close. This is probably an hour, and I don't know if it's gonna be in one phase or another, but please send in your questions uh, to um, uh, asksam at um, velasta.net and we'll get to those also. I hope this has helped. Thank you.